Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine, Pipeline CRM, joining you from San Diego. And today I'm joined by Margie Agin, who is in Falls Church, Virginia. How are you doing, Margie? Doing well, thanks. Yeah, excellent. And Falls Church, not far from my old stomping ground in Vienna, Virginia, so that's nice. And Margie is the founder and chief strategist of Centerboard Marketing. And today we're going to talk about brand storytelling. And you um, had a book, I think it came out last year, is it Brand Breakthrough, how to, how to go beyond um, your catchy uh, tagline to build authentic, influential, sust and sustainable brand personality. Well, that was easy for me to say. <laughs> <laughs> That's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about brand storytelling, because I, I don't think a, a lot of people maybe understand what that means uh, and, and how a brand can be so multifaceted. Sure. So I would look at brand storytelling um, through the lens of the hero of the story, which is your customer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a, a lot of people may think about, and this is an aspect of it, but they think about brand storytelling as sort of the origin story of your company, right? Kind of how you came to be and what you stand for and your values and, um, and beliefs, as well as your products and services. And, and that is a part of it, and that will come into play. Um, but the truth is, your customers aren't sitting around thinking about you and your story, right? They really just care about themselves and their own perspective on the world and the own problems that, that they're trying to solve. So we look at brand storytelling kind of through the eyes of the customer, they're on their own journey, right? They're dealing mm -hmm. with a bunch of problems in their own world, their own status quo, before they ever meet you, <laughs> and, right. right? So if you look at the world from, from their perspective, a story kind of starts from that position, the position that this customer or the hero of your story uh, is, is in. They have certain goals, they have challenges, they have a context. And then what really kicks off the story, they have some kind of an aha moment, a trigger. It could be something that happens to them, or it could be you enter their world in some way and, and you know sort of force that realization. Mm -hmm. Your, the, your character in the story as the brand is basically the guide, you know, the one that holds their hand and, and goes alongside them as they progress throughout their story. And then at the end of the story, it's sort of the new normal, you know, the, mm. the, the vision hopefully is achieved and, and they're in this new world. So it is your job as the brand to kind of paint the picture of what that new normal could look like on the other side of the mountain and how you're going to get there. Yeah. And obviously, if you're going to act as the guide, then you need to be able to hold their hand at all parts of the customer journey and not and I think this is where the big, I think this is where a lot of brands fall down is because they promise this, uh, you're going to have a wonderful experience, and we're going to guide you and all of that. And maybe they do maybe during the sales part, they do maybe even during the onboarding or whatever, but at some point in the process, mm -hmm. they let you down. And then that becomes, and therefore they haven't delivered on on the brand promise, and your experience of the brand then turns into an ambivalent, if not negative, one. Yeah, the the brand journey and the customer's journey is a lot longer than those first few steps, mm -hmm. right? Um, and there's a lot of ups and downs all throughout that journey. So I work with a lot of uh, B2B technology companies where even the sales process itself, even before they close the deal, can be very yeah. long. It could be nine mm -hmm. months, right? And there's a lot of decisions that, that have to be made and, and ups and downs and choices because there's there are high ticket items and there's a lot of risk involved, right? So some of the things we try to do in telling the brand story is address all the different types of questions and hurdles and fears that a B2B customer may have before they make the decision to purchase. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, in, in a sales environment, you might think of them as sort of objections and, and objection handling, mm -hmm. right? So from the marketing perspective, we can help to answer some of those questions through content or other types of materials that we produce on the website ever, even before that customer even talks to a salesperson, right. right? So they're more educated and more prepared. And then to your point, 
once the deal is done, the, the customer story continues. So a lot of times sales and marketing both sort of think, you know, their job is done. They're incentivized based on driving mm -hmm. new leads and pipeline, right? <laughs> so they, they go mm -hmm. on their merry way, but you know, the customer still is interacting with service people and technical people and implementation people and as well as um, other types of customers and new issues that come up, right? Yeah. So I think what used, we used to think of in terms of the funnel where it was very straight, yep. you know, the customer journey and the sales funnel were sort of only married up until the point of, <laughs> of close, <laughs> of yeah. deal close. And now we kind of look at it a little bit more almost like an infinity loop. So you, after the deal is closed, the customer continues on. And, and our role in both marketing and sales is to, is to drive loyalty and you know brand affinity and keep that relationship going and the trust going so that either they renew right and we mm -hmm. start the cycle again or they become an advocate in some way and they help bring in additional customers yeah There's because they because let's face it i mean the, the customer doesn't differentiate the customer do, you know everything is the brand right it's the company so their experiences are always the company they don't go well Actually, yeah, the, the customer service wasn't that great, but this, the the sales was really good and the implementation was really good. So I'm still up on the company. They just, I mean, it's just the company and every experience becomes part of the company experience. If you, if you do it right and you're able yeah. to be consistent, then your company, sort of the the character in the, in mm -hmm. the brand story, back to our original conversation, you know, has certain consistent personality traits and that those traits are shared. They might be expressed slightly differently, but those, those core traits are shared by everybody mm -hmm. that the customer touches and experiences, whether that's on the voice online, during the chat, right, or the salesperson or the customer service person or whoever. So when uh, at Centerboard, when we work with companies, we spend a lot of time talking about the brand personality of the business, sort of making the business seem a little bit more like a person. Right, and really fleshing out sort of those core characteristics, and then also ensuring that everybody in the organization who will have some kind of customer interaction, you know, buys into that definition, really understands it, embraces it, and knows how to express it. So, how do you how do you actually assess a, a company's brand personality? That's because it seems question. like a lot of a lot, yeah, because a lot of times, I mean, I'm sure people would say, "Oh, yeah, well, that's for the big companies, that's for the apples and all of that. I'm just a small company, mm -hmm. but so how do you assess your brand personality? Yeah, great question. Um, and or I also hear that's for B to C companies. Right, you know, right. B to B companies don't like that, or you know, we don't deal mm -hmm. with any of that fluffy stuff. It's just you know the tech and the and the logic and the facts. <laughs> but right. I can think of a, many examples of B two B companies and smaller companies that that are doing this very well. Um, and I'll just put one out, which is Slack. Um, mm -hmm. Slack, which has suddenly taken on you know in the last couple of years, really accelerated in uh, in terms of its uh, adoption. And when that company sort of the way that they communicate. Through their, through their product, as well as the people that you interact with and the, and the marketing content, have a very distinctive voice, a tone of voice, the vocabulary that they use, the examples that they choose, as well as the, the colors and, and the identity mm. and sort of the, you know, the visual look. And they all tie together. So all of those go into sort of choosing a brand personality that is authentic to an organization that really sounds like your real voice of what the, the people and the culture in an organization would say. And every company has some kind of a core culture that, uh, that it, it, it sort of, that they may not even recognize themselves. It sometimes right. takes an external perspective or sometimes just takes the right questions to uncover, but they know it. They, 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 it's a sort of a voyage of self-discovery. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's the personality of the founder, right? For a small company that has a lot to do with how the rest of the organization functions. Um, but in many organizations have kind of a, you know, core cultural priorities. So one of the things we do is talk about to different people in an organization uh, through workshops, through 
surveys, you know, through hands-on kind of activities and questions that really get to the differentiating core cultural characteristics of the company. All right, so once we sort of prioritize those, we may have some that are at the baseline, you know, kind right. of fundamental, and then some that we get to the point where it's truly differentiating unique kinds of characteristics. And then, then we kind of know, okay, this is what makes this company's personality shine. The second piece um, that we'll look at to try to, so take that kind of definition off the page and bring it to life, um, I do kind of a tour of different brand personalities, <laughs> I guess you could call it. Um, I, you'll often find companies that say, well, I don't really know, but I know it when I see it. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I like to show examples of how different brands um, define their personality and then based on that communicate so they can see it in real life. Mm -hmm. um, one of the tactics is, um, if you've heard of archetypes. Yes, yeah, I was so, going to ask you about yeah. those. Yeah, and I think, you know, if you've ever done tarot card readings or mm -hmm. <laughs> you sure. know, any of this kind of stuff, there's sort of these fundamental archetypes that are in people's psyche. Um, mm -hmm. And because we already kind of know them as sort of archetypal characters, you can rely on that to sort of set the foundation. So just a few at the top of my head, maybe there's like six or seven kind of core ones that I often use in a B2B setting. Some companies are the guide, as we've talked about. Mm -hmm. you know, that's someone who's right there with you, holding your hand as you face the trials. Other companies are more of a rebel. You know, they, they're taking on the status quo and, you know, shattering the status quo and mixing things up. Um, I, some companies are more of like a magician where they, <laughs> yeah, they, they, uh, you know, kind of have this kind of special power. They don't necessarily explain how it's done, but it's sort of almost a magical, mystical kind of power mm -hmm. to, to change things. Um, so there, there's a whole set of these. One other I'll, I'll mention is the jester. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's maybe not as common in a B2B scenario, but you know, a company that, you know, joke, they can be serious when they need to solve a problem, but they do sure. it in a very lighthearted, funny way. Mm -hmm. right. um, mm -hmm. So we kind of look at these different archetypes and show examples of brands that have personified these archetypes in their marketing and sales um, materials and the way they speak. And then you start to see, you know, a company uh, uh, will look at that and say, mm, this one does not feel right to me. I'm not comfortable with that. You know, but that one, yeah, that sounds like something I'd say. Uh, and that's how you sort of narrow down what the brand personality definition is for, for a company. Yeah, because the last thing you want to get is a little schizophrenic, right? Because it's funny, it's interesting sometimes people will, um, I'll even find in a company, somebody will say, oh, look, look how this company communicated with us, you know, with me. And it was all funny and it was lighthearted and like you were saying, and it was all of this and that, you know, we should do some of that. And and th I think that's the danger is that people pick different pieces from all these archetypes. And so suddenly now, instead of having... <laughs> A unified personality right. you're almost like what's that what was that Frankenstein one, uh, <laughs> yeah, or what was that one right. Ca Ca what was that? I can't remember the one Sybil you're with Sybil oh, with yeah. the multiple personalities, personalities. right <laughs> poor Sybil yeah. yeah and you know or just they're Frankensteining things together yeah. they say I like this piece I like that piece mm -hmm. and this piece but it's not consistent you know or I had we had a summer intern who handled our yeah. social media for the summer and so it was all very like you know, jokey and, you know, sort of... Be because that can be counterproductive, yeah. right? Because you can yeah. suddenly get, like, something that's... You have an idea right. of the personality of the company you're dealing with, and some, some yes. you get something out of left field, and you're like, well, this is a bit odd. <laughs> right, right. That consistency is really key. So once we have a, a brand personality kind of definition on a page, um, one of the key things that Center Board does is create sort of assets that will help an organization then embrace the brand and actually mm -hmm. deploy it. Um, and I mean, the sad thing is you know, over half of people working in B2B organizations say that they don't understand their company's brand essence, right? Mm -hmm. Or even more say they themselves don't know how to express it. 
And that's very sad because if you yourself can't do it, then how do you expect your customers to sort of to buy mm -hmm. into that and go along with you? Um, so we'll do things like, you know, beyond just a basic uh, editorial or style guide, which most companies have, you know, we give a lot of examples about how you would use these words in practice. What might an email look like? You know, what might a chat message look like? What, what might, um, you know, a social media ad look like? To, so that they can really see examples of different tone of voice choices um, that people on the ground, on the front lines would mm -hmm. actually use. Um, so that's that's pretty key. And um, let's say it's a brand new brand personality. That rollout has to be managed pretty carefully. So it doesn't just feel like you, the company awoke one day and this brand new you know, brand definition was given to them from the mountaintop. Um, right. We spend a lot of time with the internal rollout and and workshops, um, workshops and trainings and other types of you know small group kind of breakouts to to help people learn how to apply the, a brand personality in their day to day jobs. Yeah, and I think that's the thing is that it, there is always there is often I'm saying always there's often that disconnect between when you know marketing goes through a process like this and they roll out and because a lot of a lot of people's experience of if they're not in the marketing department is getting. The, the brand guidelines, right? Suddenly just sent to you, like, here's here's your brand guidelines. Don't use your logo like this. Don't do this. Don't do that. And that's their only experience. And it's not right. what you were just saying is actually really equipping them to be ambassadors mm -hmm. for the brand, understanding their, where they sit in the organization, the kind of things that they do and how they might need to communicate with the um you know, communicate with, with customers or, or other people. And there always often seems to be that disconnect. Yeah, I find that's true. There's a lot of time spent on, on the logo and the visual identity. Mm. Like you said, yeah. you know, here's the lockout, here's what to do. And that's obviously very important for the design side or any, any contractors or third parties that are doing that. And the same attention needs to be paid with, with the words. But I think, unfortunately, that becomes a bit of an afterthought when companies go through you know, a brand refresh or develop mm -hmm. their identity. Yeah. Laura Mips some copy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> As a placeholder. And then, uh, you know, it's up to people to interpret. So, you know, when, when I see a, a style guide that says, we speak in a, in a friendly, approachable tone of voice. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. What does that actually mean? <laughs> but, in, it, you know, when you put pen to paper, everybody's going to interpret that slightly differently. So we need to have real examples um, that that help people do, you know, know how to do their work, so they don't have to try to make it up as they go along. Yeah, and it doesn't mean. And sometimes when you say like we have a friendly style, it doesn't mean that you go, hey, hey, <laughs> right. you know, hey yeah, yeah, exactly <laughs> like that, and everything yeah. is really casual, and I, because that doesn't. And I think that's the thing that drives me a little bit crazy nowadays yes. is, is when you have brands that communicate with you in an overly uh, friendly, mm -hmm. casual, and it's inappropriate for what you're looking for at the time, right? You know, maybe sometimes you're, maybe you have an issue or whatever, and, and you want, there's something serious, and they're like, hey, hey, cool. Right. Yeah. And you're like, yeah. Oh, yeah, hey, it's not cool. No, actually, it's serious. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that gets to you context. You know, and yeah. sort of back back to taking it from the customer's perspective. Mm -hmm. Like, if you're if you have a customer that's writing in with a, with a technical issue yeah. <laughs> you know, or yeah. a serious problem, um, you have to understand the context they're coming from. You know, or mm -hmm. or if they're in the context right now of dealing with remote workers because of yeah. the pandemic, or you know, managing you know real operational challenges because of you know, the, the situation that mm -hmm. we're in with, with Corona, like we have to maybe take it down a notch to sort of acknowledge their context and really think about where they're yeah. coming from first. Yeah. yeah. So um, in, in the last few minutes we have here, how would you advise uh, any organization or people that are listening right now how to do maybe a little bit of an audit on their own brand personality? Yeah, an audit is a good first step to, to look at the different pieces that you have Mm -hmm. um, let's just take in terms of content, right? Your, your right. website or sort of con content pieces or um, even emails that you've been sending, your sales deck, right? These mm -hmm. kind of pieces. And I would look at it, in, you know, in a couple of ways. You know, one, 
I mean, no company is perfect, right? But you right, know, are sure. you, as you said, sort of the Sybil or the Frankenstein, right? <laughs> <laughs> are you able to maybe define yeah. some core themes that are, that are running through that? Um, you can also look at that and, and ask yourself the question, um, if, if I, we took the logo off of this content and no one knew who it was from, would, would people know what company wrote this? Is it distinctive enough that something actually stands out to say, ah, this is their voice, you know, what they say and how they say it. Mm -hmm. So, um, and so that's an interesting test. Um, I'm not the first person to say that, but I, that's sure. a really interesting test is to, you know, take the logo and the branding off of it, pretend like you don't know it or give it to somebody, you know, <laughs> who, yeah. who didn't know where it came from and say, you know, would I know? And and if the answer is no, then you have a little bit of work to do to say, to really kind of dig into that self awareness journey and say, what is it about our company that we want to put forth into the world, yeah. and then check is that something that my customers actually care about? Right, mm -hmm. we got to have that match, or it, or it doesn't matter. Right. At the yeah. end of the day, you have to look from the customer perspective. So the other place to start is start talking to customers, you know, mm -hmm. either do it yourself or, you know, have an ind independent third party do it who can sometimes ask questions in a different way than your own brand can and kind of, you know, get some insights that customers are willing to yeah. tell, you know, a third party sometimes in ways they don't tell the brand itself. Um, and that that's where I always start is talking to the customers because truthfully you may think your your brand personality is something but it's really what they say about you when you're not in the room that yeah, no, that's what your real brand is absolutely no no I love that that's that's a great piece of advice this is Margie this has been fantastic all of Margie's information will be below this video but before we go Margie please tell us a little more about yourself and your company Sure. So, um, as you mentioned, um, I'm the chief strategist of Centerboard Marketing. Um, we focus mainly on B2B technology companies, and that this is what we do. We help them define what makes them unique and then find the words to say it. So, what that means in practice is we create marketing kind of infrastructure, marketing messaging, um, brand identities, uh, brand personalities, and then we take those kind of infrastructure assets and turn them into customer-facing content. So websites, um, core thought leadership content, sales presentations, and sales enablement tools. Perfect. That's fantastic. Listen, uh, listen, Margie, this has been great. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner, CRM. See you all for another interview really soon. Thank you. Thanks very much. It was a pleasure.